Welcome to the Gate World Podcast. Welcome, everyone, to episode number 145 of the Gate World podcast. I'm Darren. And I'm Adam. Adam is joining me today. I'm super excited to have you on the show, Adam. Uh, everyone, I'm going to introduce you to Adam here in just a minute. This is the podcast where two nerds talk about Stargate. Uh, and I'm so glad to have another nerd with me on today. Adam, welcome to the show. I hope that Gate World listeners are going to uh, have a chance to get to know you a bit better. They've been seeing some of the stuff that you've been writing on the site, but uh, we'll get to know each other a little bit better in this podcast. And then we'll get to talk about uh, the first half of Stargate Origins. That's our main topic for today. Adam, welcome. Hi, Darren. Thanks for having me. You may have heard Adam's voice already if you listen to the official Stargate podcast. My former partner in crime, David Reed, uh, spun off and uh, joined the team over at StargateCommand.co, where he does the official Stargate podcast now. I was David's first guest when that kicked off last year, and then you were his second guest. Yeah, yeah, it was the second episode. It's a tough act to follow up because you've been doing this for so <laughs> long, and I'm the new kid on the block, so it was... Heart was beating fast. I was very nervous, but it turned out to be really fun. David's very laid back and knows how to guide the ship. So it was super cool. And we interviewed uh, Bruce Willotion, who did a lot of the visual effects supervision for from the pilot of Children of the Gods all the way through to late seasons of Atlantis. And it was a great experience and it was a cool intro, but I'm super excited to be on the Gate World podcast because that's what I grew up listening to when I was, you know, 14, 15, 16 in oh. high school is when <laughs> I know the age thing. But when <laughs> I was like grew up listening to you. Right. Well it's it's cool because I think like I'm with not a, that old. No, you're not. It's cool because I think with a lot of these big franchises, Stargate included, the second generation who grew up inspired by the content is now producing the content or being a part of the journey, kind of like with, you know, J.J. Abrams and Star Wars or Colin Trevorrow with Jurassic World, like all these people who grew up with these really seminal franchises and now they're getting to contribute and add their voice because they were inspired by it. And I think it's just a super exciting time to be a fan or to, to be a storyteller because the opportunities are limitless with the new age of distribution. Yeah, that's so true. And even with Stargate, we're going to talk here in a few minutes about Origins. Yeah. And the first thing that we that we spotted when they announced Origins at Comic-Con last July, and then they started casting, they gave us some casting news early in the fall. This is a young cast, and it's a young crew. It's, it's writers, by and large, and a director, and a main cast that, you know, with the exception of Connor Trenier, you know, they're more or less in their 20s. And so they were they were kids when when SG one was first on the air. It's really funny that you mentioned that because I'm actually friends with some of the uh, some of the crew for Stargate Origins, and I have a oh, lot funny. of mutual friends with the director. And it's especially interesting because I first started looking at film schools in California when I was about 15 or 16 because I was ex inspired a lot by Atlantis and Stargate Universe, and I wanted to learn how to be a filmmaker. And I thought if I can just go to these schools and, you know, succeed, maybe like 20 years from now, there'll be a reboot of Stargate and I'll be able to be a part of it. That was kind of like my, my pipe dream as a filmmaker. And so I went to Chapman University, which is in Orange County. And it's kind of right now the sister cool, uh, sister, sorry, sister school of University of Southern California. So I got very well networked with those student bodies. And when, uh, when it came time to find a director for Stargate Origins, they hired Mercedes Bryce Morgan, who was a class of 2016 at USC Film School. And so she pulled a lot of crew who were in their early 20s from you know recent grads of Chapman Film School and recent grads of USC. And they're the camera crew. They're the assistant director. They're the wow. um, they're the grips. And like these are people who I went to school with, who I did you know group projects with just two or three yeah. years ago. 
Um, so that was pretty surreal, but it's cool because like in some way, even though I wasn't part of the crew, my dream came true because all my peers and the people I surrounded myself with got to contribute to Stargate and got to be a part of that next generation. So it is really a super exciting time for me. That's amazing. Uh, okay. So before we get into the main discussion, you said Stargate kind of pushed you into the industry. It led you to film school. It, it led you to, you know, start to consider things like storytelling and, and cinematography and stuff. Before that, before film school, what part did Stargate play in your life? You said you started watching when you were, what, 13 or 14? Oh, boy, yeah. It was, it was a 2007, I think, so that's 11 years ago, yeah. Okay, so you came in to fandom after Atlantis had started? Yeah, you know, I came in kind of on the tail end. I think one of the first episodes I watched live or I DVR'd it was Adrift, so it was a season four premiere of Atlantis, and... I think I didn't really know what was going on because I was picking episodes here and there and watching reruns. I didn't quite know what was new and what was old, but I was so enamored with that sense of adventure and that kind of quixotic passion and exploration that the team had. that It was magnetic. The Atlantis team was crewed by scientists and military personnel of today. You know, this isn't a fantasy realm. This isn't the future. This is, for all intents and purposes, here and now. There's these explorers that are in another galaxy that we don't know about, but they're just like us. And that felt really attractive to me. And it was easy to relate to. Yeah, that's so cool. That here and now moment, that aspect of Stargate, that it's it's people like us, people who, you know, make make jokes and references that we're familiar with uh, or who are part of the the U.S. Armed Forces. Exactly. That's, I hear yeah. that so, so much. That's what grabbed people. That's why, you know, it's it Stargate stands out from so many other sci-fi franchises. It's cool because just a few days ago, I believe Brad Wright mentioned that on Twitter because there's been a lot of chat about what Stargate is and what it can become. And he said, I think, uh, you know, Stargate is what it is because it's set in the here and now. And that's why it resonated with people. And I think the creators understood that. And that's why we haven't seen like a distant prequel or a distant sequel, which is what we're starting to get into now. So I think it's, you know, it used to be very centric to the 2000s and now we're starting to expand the mythology. So then where does your fandom go from there? Do you want to talk at all about your involvement in SGU and the fan campaign and that kind of stuff? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I was a fan. You know, I started to be a fan about 2007, 2008. That's when I started to start to explore the internet and what fandom had. And that's when I discovered Gateworld. And, you know, I love the site because it had the forum and the Omnipedia and the episode guides. It was I wanted to know more about the show. I wanted to talk to other people and meet other people who felt the same way about the show. So I was... That's where I, I think GateWorld came in, and you guys were starting to do the podcast on a regular basis. But a couple years into that, I had noticed there was a lot of talk about these direct-to-DVD movies, which at the time was Stargate Extinction, the Atlantis movie, and Stargate Revolution, which was the SG-1 movie. Continuum and Arc of Truth had come out. They were pretty successful, and it yeah. seemed like they were just going to go and jump in and do these two movies, and it was constant promises and then three months of complete radio silence. Yeah. And, you know, I would sometimes ask on Joe's blog or try to, you know, scavenge the internet for any information in the interviews. And all I got was, you know, the market's changed, you know, MGM is struggling financially, so we're going to have to put it on hold or we're not sure. Uh, and that was really frustrating because I wanted these stories so intensely because I came in towards the end of Atlantis. I didn't really feel like Enemy at the Gate was a proper conclusion. I mean, in retrospect, it is. But at the time, I just I wanted more and I wanted this movie format because if you look at Continuum, what they were able to do with that yeah. amount of money is spectacular. Like it was near theatrical. I just thought the production was very thrifty and and smart with how they put the money and also tell a really unique story. Continuum was one of my favorite Stargate stories of all time. They, really? they pulled it off so well, as you said, with a, a relatively modest budget. I think the budget for that one was seven, seven and a half million. Right. Now, obviously, they had they still had the standing sets from SG-1, stuff like that. Just for the listeners, I know seven million sounds like a lot of money, but for a movie, it's nothing, especially for a sci-fi movie that has, you know, a dogfight between alien craft and F-15s and yeah, you know, goes right. to Antarctica and has a submarine and you know, shoots downtown or shoots in all these locations. I mean, an episode of SG-1 is like, what, $2 million? So if you put two of those together, it's already $4 million for, you know, an hour and a half of runtime, which is around what Continuum was. So it's not that much more money than what they had to produce, you know, the later seasons of SG-1, but they made every dollar count. 
Yeah, it's really not. That that team, they had been at it for so long up there uh, at Bridge Studios in Vancouver. You know, Brad and his people really knew how to put every dollar on the screen and make it count. Uh, I actually saw Continuum for the first time in the theater. Oh, wow. Um, longtime podcast listeners might know that um, David and I were up there for our annual pilgrimage to the studio and to the convention when Continuum was done and they were premiering it for the cast and the crew. So we got to go and see it uh, in the theater, in the dark, on the big screen. I was sitting behind Michael Shanks watching it. It was amazing. It's such a, a beautiful piece. So yeah, you turn around and hope, okay, if this is what we're getting next, right, this is awesome. If if we had to give up SG-1 on TV every week, yeah. if we had to give up Atlantis, if we got one of these every year or two, then the adventure continues. And And I think Atlantis in particular was... Um, ostensibly canceled on TV with the plan that it would go on to to be this kind of ongoing Atlantis movie franchise. Enemy at the Gate was never intended to be the end of that story, um, obviously. Whether it got a sixth season or movies, there was always going to be something. So yeah, it was incredibly uh, yeah. disheartening when the bottom fell out of the DVD market and then MGM went into bankruptcy and it was just, it was clear that it was over. Right. Well, at the time before the bankruptcy really started to spiral downhill, I was seeing, you know, flares of hope, but no promises. And I, I was very young and I didn't quite know how the system works. So I thought like, we need to do something like these action mechanisms kicked in. I was like, we have to let these people know. And, you know, and my perception was that MGM was just sitting behind a desk going, Oh, well, I don't know if people want this. Obviously it's more complicated that, than that. But, you know, in my, youthful drive, I thought, we, we got to do something. We got to help make this happen. So I started the Stargate uh, Movies campaign, and I rallied a couple thousand fans. We were on LiveJournal, you know, when LiveJournal still existed, you know, Facebook, the Gate World Forum. We did, we partnered with Cell Phones for Soldiers, and we did a cell phone drive to help raise awareness for both a good cause and for the movies. We got some of the actors involved on Twitter and Joe on his blog, and we did letter mailing campaign and sci uh, sorry, social media, you know, Twitter drives. It was really a masterclass in online fandom. And I had to learn how all these different communities worked of Stargate and how the production worked and how, you know, financing worked. And that was kind of the start of some heavy involvement with fandom. And then eventually, you know, not that long after that, I, I did that intro video for Gate World and I started the Stargate's Legacy column. Wow, that's a crash course in fandom for sure. Yeah. To try and rally everyone to a cause. We got to move on with the show, but I know that SGU has a place really close to your heart. What does SGU mean to you? Whew, that's, that's tough. Um, it's tough to answer in a short amount of time. That's probably what I'm trying to say. I really resonated with the aesthetic and tone. And this is probably a benefit of me coming in very late to Atlantis. Because, you know, the minute I started getting into fandom or the, about the time I really started getting um, active online was 2008, which was when Atlantis was canceled. So for me, I was still digesting Stargate and still very current. I hadn't watched SG-1 for 10 years. Like, I hadn't seen most of SG-1 at that point either. So when Stargate Universe came along, they said it's going to be darker, it's going to be higher budget, it's going to be more organic. And, like, it was just a perfect, you know, lightning in a bottle of my age and being impressionable and looking for kind of a voice in people, you know, in characters in TV or in storytelling in TV. Stargate Universe coming along and doing something that's very kinetic, very raw, very gritty you know i didn't come to this place where it's like oh that's battlestar oh you know it's not hopeful enough to be sg1 or this isn't stargate i just thought this is amazing like this is hypnotic and i just i learned like so much of my sensibilities as an artist or as a storyteller and writing comes from what stargate universe did it just clicked i don't know what else to say i loved the realism i love the tone i love the writing it just made me feel something the main discussion well, our main discussion topic for this episode of the podcast is the first half of Stargate Origins. If you uh, haven't seen the show yet, you can go and watch it now at stargatecommand.co. Uh, it's exclusive to, to that site. That's MGM's official digital streaming platform for Stargate now. You can watch the first three episodes of Origins for free, regardless of, it, of where you live in the world. And then to watch four or five and the rest of the web series will require an all-access pass. 
We're going to talk in this podcast, Adam, uh, about just the first half of the story. So now, listeners, by the time you get to this, you may have watched more. You may have watched six and seven. You may have finished the whole thing. We should we should put in this caveat first, Adam. You and I have seen the whole thing. Yeah. We were given early access to screeners, so we've seen the next five in a sort of unfinished condition. Uh, but we're going to limit our conversation and we're going to limit the spoilers just to episodes one through five, which uh, have been up online now for a while. So what did you think of the show? First impressions. It's a very mixed bag for me. And I'll tell you why. The first time it was very offsetting. It, it didn't even click that Stargate's back. So watching it was, and especially given that it's a prequel, I liked it, but I didn't love it. It's kind of the best way to put it. And Another thing is I liked it more the second time when I had gotten over any inhibition about like, well, is it canon or is it the same tone or the same scope of story? Like, and you and I had a brief conversation about that. The more we learn, you know, what it is and what it's trying to do, the more we like it. It's just the legacy it has to live up to is so massive. Yeah. And we've been watching Stargate for so many years. Uh, I mean, some of us more than others. But uh, when you're used to the, the tonality and the production design and some of the writing choices and directing choices in SG-1 and Atlantis and Stargate Universe, there was a challenge to sort of set expectations properly for this show because it is its own thing. And it really has to be watched and enjoyed for what it is and not for what it isn't. So I've... Uh, I kind of went into it the same the same way as you, and I've I've actually been surprised that so much of the conversation online these first few weeks has focused on things like, well, the gate doesn't look right. The Stargate apparently is designed to match more the movie gate than right. the TV show, yeah. and the sound effects of when a chevron clicks into place is from the movie. And and as as Origins goes on, you realize more and more. Okay, the director and production design actually are deliberately taking a lot of their cues from the, the 1994 feature film and not from the TV series, even as they're attempting to weave in the continuity with the TV series. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's. I even think I messaged you. I was like, what are they doing with a Stargate? Like, what is the event horizon? And then, you know, when I rewatched the feature film, the original feature film, it had been so long I'd forgot that it looked very different. And I thought, oh, Origins is yeah. you know, Origins is just borrowing from the movie and not the TV show. And when you think about the time period, when is it, nineteen thirties Origins takes place? It's around what we saw at the beginning of the Stargate movie, with the Emmerich movie, um, where they excavate the Stargate. So when you and you know that that scene from Stargate, the movie, nineteen ninety four, is really the opening for Origins. You know, they took a minute right out of that movie and put it yeah. as a prologue for Origins. So again, when you look at it from that context, everything makes a lot more sense and feels more organic. It's not like oh, they didn't have the budget to properly do the gate. Yeah, put the Stargate Origins next to the feature film, and you can see why some of the choices were made in terms of some of the visual effects, right? What the what the puddle shimmer looks like, the backwards kawoosh when the yeah. gate connects for the first time. That's that's out of the movie. That's a good point. And they they lifted that footage from the beginning, from the the Giza excavation in 1928, and they also overdubbed Connor Trenier, who is now our new Professor Paul Langford. They dubbed his voiceover. When Professor Langford calls out to young Catherine, right? He says, Catherine, come. Oh, wow. I didn't notice that. Did you notice that or did, did you read that somewhere? Oh, no, I noticed it right away. I mean, uh, they've, they've made the Langfords very American, right? So in the, in the original, uh, Vivica Lindford has played the older Catherine. Uh, she's Swedish. She, she's from Uppsala. And the line in the opening of the film is, Katarina, come. Oh. So when it switches to trip from Enterprise saying, Catherine, come, <laughs> they made the Langfords really American. I did really like what Cotter Trenier brought to uh, Professor Langford. There was kind of like an ease and a confidence that I really liked. And that felt, it may be in its own right more than what it's connected to. I felt like that was really strong and it made him very watchable. I don't know what you thought about that. Yeah, the casting, uh, for the most part, I think is right on for a project uh, of this scope. Connor brings the sort of gravity to all the scenes that he's in. Alem Orion, uh, who plays the Nazi, Wilhelm Brücke, he does the same thing. He's He just has the sort of presence where he's going to take over the scene and, and everyone sort of needs to follow his lead. 
I think with these kind of shows, just in Stargate in general, it's so character centric and about people's goals. You know, you have this immense power with the Stargate. So how are you going to use it? Are you going to use it to explore or are you going to use it as, I can't say the name as well as you, but as Bruca wants to use it for power or for Germany. And I really think, and you know, Langford wants to discover and understand it. So I think having those gravities and those clear intentions and that character profile and presence is so key to having a really, you know, meaty Stargate character. Say what you will about the the villains, uh, about Nazis. They've they've been done, they've been overdone, but for this moment in Stargate history, I think it really works. It, it really makes sense to me to, to bring the Nazis in and have them be the, the sort of chief antagonists for Origins because of when it's set, right? We're in roughly 1938 Egypt. The Nazis are in power in Germany. Uh, World War II has not started yet. And we know from the TV series, we know that Germany has come into possession of the DHD, the Dow home device that was not found at Giza by the Langfords. There's a couple of references in SG-1, in the episode Watergate, in the episode The Tomb, that uh, Germans had found it in 1906. And so uh, Brucke and other other you know researchers in Germany have had access to the DHD and all the, the gate symbols and all this. For like the better part of three decades, more than three decades. Right. And this might be pointing out the obvious, but there's a lot of parallels to Indiana Jones here, um, especially Raiders yeah. of the Lost Ark, because it's the exact yeah, sure. it's, the overall intention of the Nazis is pretty much the same in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it lines up with history because Hitler was fascinated with the occult and he wanted to find he, he looked at unconventional places to find power. Or he looked at mythology or looked at. A spirituality. So the fact that this very much fits in with what we know with the Nazis and with a lot of World War II era storytelling, um, which is there were these officers who were power hungry or thought they could find some kind of artifact that could help their cause. And so it was great. I thought it was it's very vintage, but also the good production values kind of had like a nice gloss to it. So I, I liked the whole mix of tones they were going for. Yeah, and that's based on real world history. That's based on what the Nazis were up to, uh, Hitler's interests in the occult. And as you said, that's, that's basically the plot for Raiders of the Lost Ark, this sort of connection point between spirituality and mythology on the one hand and the possibility of advanced alien technology on the other hand. That's the Ark. That's why the Nazis are, are trying to get their hands on the Ark in that film. And it's why Bruca uh, is trying to get his hands on the Stargate and what he can acquire by going through the Stargate. And he thinks he can, he can go and meet the gods. So now a question about mythology and how the puzzle pieces were put together to actually dial the game. You know, one of them being the Germans had the DHD. There is a line in Origins, I think it's episode one, it might be episode two, where he holds up the piece of paper and, you know, it matches the arc of the gate with all the chevrons. And he says, yeah. I found this at like a Thai marketplace. He found it somewhere in Asia. Uh, he found this piece of paper, which helps understand, make what the DHD and how it connects to the gate. Yeah. What did you think of that? In terms of continuity, it makes sense to me again because he has had so much time. Uh, I mean, think of what Daniel put together over the course of two weeks uh, in the feature film. Uh, if Brooke has been involved since somewhere close to 1906, he's had three decades to figure out what's going on here. He's also been looking all over the world for anything related to this thing, right? Anything that might have these symbols that are on the DHD that he has, for example. So, yeah, he's picked up some uh, interesting bits of, of information, some, some fragments from, from Thailand and from elsewhere. We did a little bit of side-by-side -side comparison or at least some links uh, on GateWorld uh, when he holds up the paper and shows the, the, the drawings to Professor Langford. The drawings on that parchment are from the movie. They're from the, the cave wall on Abydos. So there's right. Right, deliberate parallels going on there. He has this fragment that he holds up that has part of the Stargate itself on it. So, yeah, he's kind of been searching the globe for information related to this. And it's, it's apparently, you know, it's stuff that all would have come out of ancient Egypt and Egyptian mythology, right, before the Stargate was buried thousands of years ago. Certainly. Yeah, it definitely enriches what we know of the genesis of how the Stargate, you know, ended up on Earth and who discovered it and how it came into play over the 20th century. So it's nice. I, re I really like the fact that it is a prequel. 
I know that's not a popular opinion. And I also got to add in another caveat. Like, a lot of people are upset that this doesn't fit in the canon, ostensibly. Yeah. So let's talk about some of those, some of those objections. Right, right. Well, just in terms of that one, it's like, I don't want to say anything or give anything away, but just wait till the end before you make your final assessment of how it fits in. Yeah, that's kind of all that you can say is this is one story, right? These episodes are not self-contained. The whole 10 episode Stargate Origins is the story. So you kind of have to watch to the end. Uh, we'll talk. Uh, we'll come back in our next podcast and be able to talk about the whole thing at a, at a bit greater length. But uh, we can at least say now the writers are aware of our angst as, <laughs> as continuity nerds. Uh, and there is an answer to that question at the end of the series why does Catherine, uh, when we see her in the 1990s, appear that she doesn't know how to dial the gate, she's never been through the gate? That question gets answered. Another criticism that I've seen that I think is is fair is the production values, the tone of the show, the type of humor that we see in the show is not what we're used to from from Stargate. Again, I think that's a, a an issue about setting our expectations properly. Right, the budget is what it is. It's not a you know even a seven million dollar continuum. It's it's a web series. It's about a hundred minutes in total. And the tone, I think, the humor, the humor really stood out to me the first time because it seems so out of place with Stargate. But when I think about it in terms of Indiana Jones, right, some of the Indiana Jones humor is pretty kind of slapstick. What did you think of that? Ah, uh, I didn't like it. I know it maybe worked in Indiana Jones. I think the low point of what I watched so far was the slapstick Nazi thing where there's that very lanky Nazi who Catherine kicks around and he's wearing like, yeah. you know, I see him in his underwear. It's like, yeah, oh, the underwear God, scene. you know, they're Germans and they're incompetent because they're Nazis and they're stiff. It's just like, come on. Like with Indiana Jones, it's a it's supposed to be just an original adventure, an original movie. This is, you know, Stargate and you have so much to cover and so much mythology with the Langfords and with the Stargate. And when you kind of stop the plot to go goofball or screwball physical comedy, especially not just for one joke, like a punchline that keeps going on and on and on and on, it, it was a little exorbitant. And that was one of my big gripes with the first five episodes. Yeah, some of those jokes just did not land with me either. And I get the intention. I want to say that I get the intention. Like, you know, you, you want this to be endearing. You don't want people to be stiff. You know, I'm not trying to take Stargate more seriously than it is. It's just, it, it didn't quite work. And it's an overdone trope. And it's like, this is a chance to show us something else. And there's some stuff with like Beale or Beale and Catherine or Wasif. Like, that worked. And that was great. And it was appropriate. And it, you know, came and it went or is intertwined with the character moments and action. It's just when you go out of your way to try to be funny, it stops being funny. It's the comedy paradox, you know? Yeah, some of those things like like the the fight with Heinrich, the Nazi and the underwear bit. Yeah, it kind of struck me as maybe trying too hard. Like, let's come up with a funny something. When it comes out naturally, I just grin from ear to ear, like when Wasif <laughs> comes through the Stargate and talks about, you know, how tingly it felt. Right. Uh, uh, Wasif was one of my favorite characters in this. He has a real screen presence, I think. Uh, and his comedy is very brief and appropriate. It feels very organic, I think. He's kind of almost like maybe Eli Wallace would be in Stargate Universe, where it's like the eyes and ears of the audience. He's the ones to say, like, this is ridiculous. I expected Nazis. And, you know, yeah. all these little quips. And, you know, when he goes to the He's gate... kind of saying out loud what the rest of us are feeling. Yeah, or what we would feel if we were there. You know, Catherine's so adventurous and Beale is so, you know, proper British military, but Wasif kind of has that everyman spirit. Yeah, totally. So what did you think of... Let's just hit two birds with one stone. Beale and Catherine and kind of the young leads. Yeah, you know what? Catherine, I think, is has always been this centerpiece. And it doesn't surprise me at all that when they decided to go back and do an origin story, that they wanted to focus it on Catherine. She is such a great character and such a centerpiece. I mean, it was it was Catherine in 1994 who brought Daniel to the Stargate. It was it was Catherine who got the program up and running again after it had been mothballed for decades. She is the the centerpiece of the Stargate story. So it's really fun to see her as a, a young woman who's kind of coming into her, her own, right? She's been working with her dad for a decade uh, as she grew up. She's been uh, learning 
cataloging. She just got a job offer because she thinks that the work with the Stargate is is maybe over because their funds have dried up. So she's going to go do something else. Um, so I really like Catherine in this. Beale and the Beale relationship is I'm, – I'm still trying to catch up. Beale – uh, right to say uh, nothing against Philip Alexander's terrific work as the actor, but uh, th- the way that he's written and some of the interactions with Catherine, uh, they grate on me, and I'm trying to figure out why. Still, <laughs> I think it's because they bicker so much. Uh, right. you, tell me what you think about this. the The romance at the beginning in episode one is is kind of sweet, and then by episode five, they're they're at each other's throats. I guess what's irritating to me, apart from the fact that they're in a relationship, what's irritating to me is seeing protagonists fight each other uh, when they don't have to, right? When they're in these extreme circumstances, we just step through a portal to another planet and we're trying to rescue my father from Nazis. Bickering seems really out of place. It's funny you mention this because one of my biggest issues with Guardians of the Galaxy 2, the sequel, is the same thing happens. They portal to this one planet and they crash the ship and they literally argue for three or four minutes for no reason. And it's all for the jokes and, you know, Rocket's the little raccoon and, you know, Chris Pratt's the Star Lord who's arrogant and his arrogance got us all in trouble. And it just goes on and on and on. And it's like, okay, it's going on one of my biggest quips with movies is when you know people fight for no reason like the conflict is inorganic so i totally agree with you there however i will say i did really like beale he okay. embodies this old british war era young officer you know i grew up on the famous five the hardy boys tin tin bigglesworth series which is about this fighter pilot and i watched a lot of those movies that old british war movies and yeah, you know yeah. philip alexander and even some of the writing to an extent so articulately embodies that kind of character i just felt at home like i was like that's it like i know who that kind of person is those people did exist and I really just enjoyed his perspective and his youthfulness, but also him kind of learning the ropes and being thrust into this adventure that wasn't quite covered in his his enlistment manuscript. The army doesn't prepare you to go to another world and go on this adventure. Uh, So it was a really good balance for me. However, to the Catherine thing, I felt like their relationship was very all over the place. And it wasn't so much like that's what they are. It's just that the writing kind of towed the line between bickering old couple and young lovebirds in love. You know, it's just, it was a mixed bag in that sense. Yeah, she almost has a kind of a schoolgirl quality about her. She is young. This is ostensibly her first serious romantic relationship. And this is one of those areas where I think it's super helpful to to go to Stargate Command and read kind of the supplemental material. They've They've really done a great job over there to kind of fill out the world that we're seeing here. So there's character write-ups, there's mission files for each of the 10 episodes that answered a lot of my questions. And one of the things that that material told me about Catherine was, Beale is not Ernest. Ernest Littlefield is, uh, in 1945, is gonna be the man that she's engaged to be married to. Here, she's, you know, 20, 21, maybe. You know, she's she's been what? She's been living in a warehouse with her father with a bunch of archeological artifacts. It feels like she's kind of stepping out into the the broader world for the first time. So this is her first serious relationship, and she's and she's enthusiastic and not entirely sure how to play it. How about the adventure? I was surprised that we're actually going through the Stargate. I was uh, looking at the the preview material, the trailers that they released, and all this, and thought maybe maybe the whole thing's going to be set in Egypt, and it's going to be running around Egypt. And if the Stargate is active. Catherine won't be around or won't be conscious to see it. Maybe that's how they're going to explain the continuity. But no, right off the bat, episode two, episode three, everybody goes through the gate. So the adventure is going to take place on a planet that is, in fact, very familiar to fans. Uh, We are on Abydos. We are on the planet that they went to in the feature film and back to again in Children of the Gods. It's funny you mention that because even up and up through the trailer releases or the teaser releases, Everyone was like, well, how is it, you know, how is Catherine going to go through the Stargate? And I guess I was just, you know, didn't pick up the obvious signs, but I thought, you know, it didn't, they don't need to go through the Stargate. It just can be about Stargate, or it doesn't need to be Catherine that goes through the Stargate. But then when you watch it, you think, oh, well, of course she has to go through the Stargate because it's Stargate. And if you look at the way Origins is structured narratively, and again, I don't want to get in the last half, but even in the first five episodes alone, there are a lot of plot point parallels or 
tonal parallels to the original movie. You know, and I think that's oh, kind yeah, of totally. that's very much a popular thing to do nowadays. Like if you look at say Star Wars with The Force Awakens or the Jurassic Park franchise with Jurassic World, there are these single movie adventures that are different from the original movie, but they still follow a lot of tropes or a lot of overall trends, you know? Yeah, J.J. Abrams said when he agreed to do Force Awakens, one of the first decisions that he made was that he wanted it to end with a trench run. Right, right. And that, you know, that was a little much for me, but to that point, like the idea is if you're rebooting a franchise, you want to recall what people love about it. You want to remind people like this is Stargate. We're going to go through the gate. We're going to meet a race of people. You know, we're going to have an antagonist that wants to use this power, you know, is in search of something that we have to stop them. I mean, this is getting into the very last episode, but you meet Kasuf. And what was cool is that even though he's much, much younger than when we saw him in the original movie, he has this kind of presence that Skara had. And yes, Skara is his son, but it's cool. You're getting getting that same kind of youthful engagement with the team, except from Kasuf uh, when he was young. And I, I thought that was really cool. It's like, it makes you feel at home in many ways. Some people don't like it as much because it's like, I've seen this, but for me, it's like, oh yeah, like... We're getting like a retelling, a, t- a, sp- a tonal retelling, not an exact narrative match, but it's the feel you get. The flow is the same. Yeah, the, the, the sort of echoes and rhymes of Stargate. And some things that come up later in the series are going to rhyme with the feature film. We'll, we'll have to talk about that in the next podcast. Certainly. But you're right. We should talk about Kasuf. They kept this under wraps, I think, successfully. That uh, That's who Daniel Rashid was playing. He ends up being a young Kasuf. I don't know. How, how old would you guess Kasuf is in this? 16, 15, maybe? Yeah, I'm doing the math here. And I posted about this on GateWorld. If Kasuf is about 16 in 1938, then he was born in 1922. By the time the feature film rolls around, the, the, the Kasuf that we know and love, played by Eric Avari, is well into his 70s. Eric Avari was, in fact, about my age. He was in his early 40s when he played Kasuf in the movie. Really? And then the last, remember the last appearance of Kasuf in SG-1? Do you remember what episode that was? No, you have to refresh my memory on that. Um, he pops up in season four when we meet Shifu, okay. the, the Harsesis. So he's in absolute power in season four. That would have, if you trace the timeline down, Kasuf in that episode is 80 or close to it. So uh, he looks terrific for an 80-year-old in absolute power. Um, my point just being, I was kind of surprised that, that they ended up using Kasuf in this way. The character works really well in the story. Daniel Rashid is just magnetic in the yeah. way that he plays this kind of young, kind of naive, always grinning Kasuf. Uh, but I would have thought timeline-wise, Kasuf might have been a baby. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's a bit of continuity time. You have to stretch, you know, you have to compress some arcs you have to someone has to be a bit older or younger than they say then you know previous works have established i think that's mostly acceptable for a story like this and if you look at daniel rashid he has that look where it's like he could play a 14 year old or he could play a 25 year old there's kind of this whole range and i don't think it's specified so i think the whole idea is you want that youthful presence that's a compliment daniel yeah oh yeah it's, it's gonna come in handy 10 years from now well, there's a couple more characters that that show up here in episodes four and five that we should talk about before we break, which is the baddies. Uh, first, we meet the the local ruler of Abydos. Now, we should we should specify this is still Ra's planet. Abydos is in Ra's domain, has been for thousands of years, but ruling in his stead is a set, or as Kasuf pronounces it, Auset. What do you think of her? She was great. I really liked her presentation. And this ties into a compliment I have for the entire series. The costume, makeup, character design, set design, set decoration, it's really yeah. good. Like that's that was the takeaway when I watched it. I did watch all 10 in one sitting, but just, you know, for any episode, pick any episode, 
the design and the sets just look right. And they look, you know, for everyone who complains it's low budget, I'd say look at the lengths they went to to match the visual continuity of the original movie and also provide something that's very textured and very fitting for all the characters. You know, from all the way from Beale and from the tent, you know, his, his little outpost through a set's design. I liked it and it's a little different than what we've seen and that's good I think because it's a different time period and a, a different different villain and what did you think? Yeah, I think she's she's great and where they take her in the second half of the story is really fascinating. If you're a little bit frustrated with Origins being kind of a, a shorter production and a lower budget production, I'm really excited about about what they do with her as an original character. Again, some of this comes out through the mission files on StargateCommand.co. You read more about what is actually motivating a set to do some of the things that she does. She's a bit of a, a rebel. I don't think it's by episode five. I don't think it's a, a spoiler to say, right? She's got this conversation with Sir Ket in episode five that gives you the indication she might be planning a rebellion against Raw. She might be... Uh, looking to form an alliance with with the Nazis because she's trying to get resources. She's trying to get people in order to eventually rise up against Ra. She's no fan of Ra. Sir Ket, on the other hand, Sir Ket is her servant, her warrior right hand. I don't think Sir Ket is a Jaffa. I think it's it's pretty clear, and it's been confirmed on the official site that she's a she's a Gould. She's a, a warrior. She's the same race as a Set, and they both have those yellow eyes. I don't think the yellow eyes is meant to be a shortcut for, for Gould eyes glowing. I think it's just, well, the way that I take it is I look at a, a race like the Incarens. Remember the Incarens from uh, season four, Scorched Earth? Yeah. They had kind of yellow eyes as well, yellow in a different sense. Uh, and for them, it, it had been environmental. They needed to find a new home planet because they they were very sensitive to certain environmental conditions. So I think these two probably just found host bodies yeah, uh, yeah. that that have, you know, so many thousands of years since since the human were, were taken from Earth. They've kind of evolved this way. I would have liked for the show to have delved a little bit farther into the jaffa Goa'uld relationship and also clarify. Yeah. Through, I mean, you know, very basic thing like, you know, the eyes glowing as an establishment, it would not have, you wouldn't have to shoehorn that in or derail the story. It's a very simple fix that just kind of got overlooked. I mean, I'm okay with it. It doesn't derail any of the mythology or continuity. It just would have been nice to get that little extra detail. Yeah. So uh, a set and Sir Ket, I think are, because they're new creations for the show, um, they're where my attention has gone. Yeah. Uh, and the way that they're kind of, of driving the story forward. I'm, I'm excited to talk about where they go in the next five episodes. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that was really piqued my interest and also wasn't sure how I felt about was actually like the design, the costume and the appearance of a set and Sir Cat. And they are very like sensual and it's kind of was a little, I mean, we've seen that before in Stargate, but this was a little different. Some of it was very blatant. But the thing is, you also get this idea that she's very maternal. She, you know, she's matriarchal. She has this like royalty, and that design is there for a reason. You know, because yeah. um, I think it's like you know, it's the age-old sci-fi issue where it's like over-sexualizing you know female protagonists. It just needs to be for a reason. But I think there's like a regality to Asset which comes across very clearly, and it almost adds to her presence. It makes her a little more intimidating because she is very like, <laughs> and so I hate this word, but it's very vulnerable or out there but she also has this security about herself i liked her as a female character i think that's going to tie in and be very important to how her story and her interaction with our heroes rolls out yeah she is maternal right literally she's holding a baby for half of her scenes yeah, uh, yeah. we'll have to talk in the next uh, next podcast when we do the whole of origins we'll have to talk about the harcesis and what's going on with that Well, do stay tuned for the next episode of the podcast. We're going to have Adam back, and we're going to talk about the rest of Stargate Origins. Uh, we'll focus on the last five episodes and the whole story. Uh, those are going to be available for you to watch online if you have an all-access pass at stargatecommand.co. Uh, with the all-access pass, you can watch episodes six and seven are dropping or have dropped this week. And then next week... From the, from the time that we are recording, next Thursday, 
is going to be March 8th. Uh, they're going to do all the rest of them. The last three episodes are going to drop all at once. So that's 10 episodes. Uh, they've landed over the course of about a month. And the next episode of the podcast will be up sometime after March 8th. And we'll talk about all of Stargate Origins. Now, Adam, I hope to keep you around. Maybe you'll do a third one of these with me and we can talk about what comes after Origins. I'd love to do a show where we talk about, you know, if there's a second season of Origins, if they do another short form web series, what would we like to see them do? Uh, if if they're going to spin up a fourth full length TV series, what do we think about that? We've been doing some coverage on that on Gate World. Everybody should go and check out the, the pieces that we've been writing. We've been taking polls about what people want to see. So we'll get your take on that when we do a future podcast. Awesome. Looking forward to it. So again, to watch Stargate Origins, go to stargatecommand.co. Uh, and of course, check out gateworld.net, where each and every week we've got full coverage of Stargate Origins. Uh, we do news. Now, this is something I haven't got to do for a long time since Stargate was on the air. A big part of my enjoyment of the show is picking it apart, picking apart the, the plot, the continuity bits, tie-in to, to past episodes. Uh, so in the episode guide at gateworld.net slash origins, I'll do uh, episode analysis each and every week. We'll, we'll trace uh, character development. There's production notes. All the good stuff is there in the episode guide. Uh, we'll have screen captures for every episode's uh, all the usual stuff that you're used to finding at GateWorld. Adam, any last words? I really enjoyed having Stargate back. Per Origins is Future, I like the format. I think it's probably difficult for a lot of people to accept that like a web series or digital series is the reboot, but I think it, it did its job and it is a really fun adventure i mean i was talking to my dad he's a very you know the casualist of casual viewers and he yeah. said look i like he saw the first three episodes he said i like it it's fun obviously you know a little smaller scale and lower budget but it's like it's charming and i think with time people will realize that and i do hope regardless of what happens with a fourth series or another movie or that we get more origins series because they're not expensive to produce and they can really enrich certain characters or plot threads. So I think it's going to be an adjustment period, but Stargate has a bright future. Great last word. Uh, we'll talk more next time. Thanks Adam for joining me. Thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for listening to the gate world podcast. 